So um, I am from I have been called Technology Los Angeles, which you all know. Um, and today is really exciting for me because we do a lot of talking about the same to investors and potential and business partners, new people, and usually they're like really fast, five million quick um, pitches. And it's quite nice to have some time to actually kind of share where we're at and some of the stuff we don't totally know how to solve. Um, so this is going to be a talk that's less about starting, scaling, and selling, and more about bootstrapping, iterating, um, and building capacity and understanding as we go, because that's basically how we build our business. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and my co-founder's background, because it feels um, like it kind of frames some of the points I'm going to make really nicely. So my background is in branding, innovation, and design. I worked with an international branding company called Wolf Owens um, for about nine years as a design director and a social impact director. So I worked with businesses like Skype and Google and Project Red to do brand strategy and, and brand kind of development. My co-founder's background is, who's not here, he's somewhere else watching someone else. <laughs> but um, he, his background is in something called physical computing, so engineering for creative application. He builds large-scale interactive installations, objects, spaces um, for commercial clients such as AOL, Nike, so you could kind of say that both of our skills combined kind of birthed technology will save us. Um, but the reason I talk about the background is because what I'm really going to focus on is the importance of brand and our purpose in not only kind of building our business, but in actually scaling and fundraising. Um, we developed a really clear story really early on about what we stood for, why we were doing it, a name that really described that to ourselves and to the people that we kind serve. Um, and that has stayed very important to the core of the business and really um, kind of dictates how we grow the business and how we scale and how we find fundraising. So I'll kind of keep referring back to that as a point. So our story starts in a kind of unlikely place in a trash can. Um, so we live in a really kind of interesting area in London called East London. It's, it's called Hackney. Um, and we live in a converted kind of warehouse um, area with kind of young professionals, creative people, and one day we came home and we found a laptop in a trash can. We were pretty shocked. It was a kind of fully functioning laptop in a bag with a, with a, a power cable. It had a new install of Windows XP. We were pretty shocked that someone just threw it away. Um, so we took it out, we cleaned it up, and we donated it to my co-founder's um, sister's charity in South Africa. And this really began this dialogue around the fact that we have so much technology in our lives. We don't really know what to do with it when we don't want it. We don't know how to fix it. And most importantly, well, maybe it's the exception of a lot of people in this room, but the general population does not really know how to be creative with it. We don't really know how to make things with it. Not because we don't want to, but because we don't have the skills to do it. Because our tech are these black boxes that we don't understand. We don't really, we're not invited to do things with it. So we set ourselves a challenge. Could we actually build a business that addressed that, those needs in a way that was fun, inspiring, um, and actually empowering to people? So we did what any kind of ambitious, slightly crazy people do. And we spent a year kind of crafting what this business was about. Many dinner parties, many um, kind of labors later, we decided to just do it. So we launched our first workshop. Um, this is our first workshop, which is quite friendly to the public, which is done. Um, at the Kinetic Art Fair, which is a, a big art fair in London in a big warehouse space. Um, we launched with our first kit, which was a, a musical instrument. It's a light sound device um, that introduces people to LBRs. It's a soldering workshop. So we had hundreds of people come to that workshop, had really positive feedback. So we continued to go. So we built a business with as much, you know, kind of online platforms as we could. We launched a Kickstarter project, which was not defining the business, but launched our first um, project, which was about teaching programming. We did a MailChimp, um, which we still use until a couple weeks ago. Um, we launched a Shopify account where we started to sell products. We built our online presence using WordPress. We used GitHub. So we literally just used the platforms out there to begin to build the business. Um, so we kind of learned by doing, that is really the way we grew the business. So what we essentially make is we are a DIY kit company. We make gadgets that anyone can make. And our kits are essentially vehicles for education. They contain all of the components that you need to actually make something with technology. Um, and most importantly, our kits are essentially, oops, sorry, 
our kits are, are designed for around everyday life themes. So we don't design kits that are just um, robots with blinking eyes, although we like robots, we just don't want to design um, So our kits are designed around everyday life themes like gardening, cycling, gaming, um, potentially energy use, which is not about for um, So basically, because we leave with what you can do with the tech, not with the tech itself. So for example, the one on the left is our electrodo kit, which is conductive theta. It teaches basic electronics by using something as simple as theta, um, which everyone seems to really engage with. Um, all the way to DIY speakers, where you solder your own amplifier and then design and construct speakers out of any material. So the one on the right is um, made out of a balloon, because we did a workshop where someone actually built a speaker out of a balloon, and it was so great that we now put a balloon in every single kit. Um, all the way to things that are slightly more complicated, like this one, which I can show anyone later, which is our DIY gamer kit, where you make, play, code, and invent your own games. So you solder your own game console, so you actually make the console itself. You play two games that comes with Pong and Snake, which were programmed by a 15-year-old that did a work placement with us, who's pretty amazing. Um, then you actually begin to do basic animations and you learn programming to then design and invent your own games. Um, so we launched that last year um, in October at the Wired Conference, and it's our best-selling kit and our most expensive kit. And that was a really interesting experience for us that really kind of proved that it's not about cheap, it's about an experience and a robustness to the educational agenda, which I think has really informed our kind of development um, of our products now. And beyond just kits, we're not just a product business, we're a resource business. And I think, again, this is part of our learning as we build this business, that the resources are really fundamental to actually supporting people on their making journey. So we have online videos, really, really clear step-by-step -step manuals, um, cheat sheets that introduce people to really basic concepts around programming or about a specific electronic um, component, um, and then really interesting software that, again, kind of gives people an entry point to, to get into these worlds in a way that is um, not super, super easy, but kind of abstracted enough to allow people to kind of get into these technologies. We're not promising people that they're going to make something in five minutes. We're not promising people that they can code in 30 seconds. This is not what we're trying to do. We have long conversations about abstraction in our team. How much are we going to abstract things to allow people to enter into these skills? And our decision is that we're going to abstract things just enough but that we want to expose people to real technology and real components and expose those things in a way where people can really start to understand things. Um, interestingly enough, workshops have stayed a really interesting and important part of our business as well. We have about 10 regular workshops that we um, host in London monthly. Um, our workshops are a huge part of us staying connected to our customers. So every single person on our team um, host workshop, whether it's the business development um, person, whether it's our head of education, whether it's our sales manager. Everyone is interacting with real people on a regular basis, which I think is really important really special to our process. Workshops are where we launch all of our kits. We never release a kit to market until we've done several workshops around that kit to develop not only the interactions around the kit, where are the pain points that are confusing, but also to develop resources which really address real needs that people have around making. Um, so it's a really tangible way for us to stay close to our customers. So we built that business, or this business. Um, it was sustainable. It was profitable. And we reached a point um, about early this year where we had to make a decision. Were we going to scale the business? We saw a lot of potential for scale and growth. And we saw opportunities in a few areas. So we had a really amazing and growing community. And some of that community we weren't serving in a way that we thought we really could to actually grow that part of our community. We had a great offer, but the offer was still mysterious and not as accessible to the amount of people we thought we could really impact with this kind of um, experience. We had a production, which you know started on my kitchen table with interns and gradually grew to a mini factory in East London, but still it's not at the scale to actually begin to meet the demand we have. Um, and we had a team, which was really small, um, but couldn't, again, support the impact that we thought this business, and not just thought, wanted this business to have. So this was a very intentional decision that we were going to scale. We could have stayed the size we were, doing the business we were. We were profitable, which was kind of crazy for people to hear that we were making money. Um, 
But we made a decision to actually scale and to really grow um, the potential of the business. So in January, we basically um, addressed a particular need. So teachers have been using our kits for a long time. Um, they love our kits, but we weren't really helping them to use our kits. We weren't really supporting them to use our kits. So in January, we launched our education boxes, which are collections of kits for teachers, after schools, clubs, maker spaces, any kind of facilitated um, workshop experience. Um, they basically are collections of our kits in packs of 12 to 16. They come with all of the resources a teacher or facilitator needs to actually use our kits in curriculum. Um, we have a head of education now, and we have a um, education pioneer who are developing curriculum with teachers in schools around all of our kids. So essentially resources for teachers to begin to use our kids in much more fundamental ways. Um, so that required obviously a lot of focus, a lot of energy, a lot of time to do that. Um, our products, so our products we think are very delightful and very charming, um, but they're essentially brown boxes with stickers on them. And it's still kind of amazing to me that we sold brown boxes with stickers. Um, and that was out of necessity, you know, in terms on my kitchen table, easy to print. I mean, still, I, I love the brand we built, but it was a, 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 a necessary way of actually building a product business. Um, and increasingly, as we've grown the business, stickers and cardboard boxes meet my production manager very upset now. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of manpower. It's not the most efficient way of packing kits, especially when you reach a certain scale. Um, so we um, made a decision to essentially um, launch our um, retail packaging. It's going to be launching in um, July. You're like, is that thing people actually listed? Um, so we're going to be launching our retail um, packaging in July, which again is this really interesting step change for us. It's a way for us to reach a much larger audience. Um, it helps us to actually create the relationships with the partners that we've been working with, both retail um, as well as um, online. Um, to basically create um, a yeah. DIY, but definitely much more imaginative, playful, really paints a picture of this kind of future gadget world, which we're trying to really encourage people to be a part of. Um, and again, because we've done so many workshops, we've paid a lot of attention to how people make our kits. So our kit, our boxes are not just kind of visual ways for people to understand that, but they have um, maker trays in them, which essentially comes from insights that we've gathered from our workshops. People like to leave their, their bits in the boxes. Yeah. They need somewhere to store their stuff. And um, it's a great way for people to actually make easily. So our kits have been essentially an iteration around paying attention to how our users are using our kits, and also paying attention to how retailers need to sell products. They need to be self-selecting. They have a nice flap, which means that people look inside. For parents, and I'm a parent, you see all that stuff and you think, wow, I'm getting a lot for my money. For um, teachers, it's really exciting because you actually get to see, wow, these are the kinds of things that my young people might be exploring. Um, and you know, for the average person who's buying one of these products, it just feels like something that you're going to do over time as opposed to a kind of quick, a quick thing. So having that little flap is a really exciting thing for us. Um, so that's one way that we're addressing our offer and making it more accessible to more people. Production. So production is my most exciting and most challenging and slightly terrifying area of um, uh, focus at the moment. So um, producing kits on our kitchen table was interesting. Um, and then we moved to having a new factory in East London where we assemble, produce, do all of our R&D, and fulfill all of our kits. So the fact that we're manufacturing in an urban center still kind of delights me. I really love that we're doing that. We can basically produce about 25,000 kits in our space um, over a year, which is pretty incredible to me. Um, the volume is pretty amazing. However, to really achieve the potential and to deliver the demand that we're receiving, um, we, we actually can't. Um, so that's, it's a nice problem, but it's still a problem nonetheless. <laughs> um, so labor costs, space costs, component costs, import and export duties, fulfillment, quality control, building the demand, these are the challenges of increasing production. These are the things that we are facing right now. And it's a chicken and the egg, right? Do you build the demand before you have the production to do it? Do you build the production for the demand? Do you kind of just do it all at once? Um, so yeah, so these are some of our assemblers. We have three permanent assemblers assembling in our space at all times. Um, we have ping pong tables slash assembly tables. Um, it's, it is a, a dynamic and exciting space, but it's not the most efficient space, and that's one of the things we're addressing um, this year. Um, equally, 
We focused a lot on who we are and what we're good at. We are designers, makers, resource creators. We are not production experts, so we're seeking um, experts and expertise. We are building relationships with much more senior level people that have come from those kind of production capabilities. Um, paying London rates for space and people does not encourage you to build capacity to do production in the city. So what we're focusing on right now is growing our production volumes through relationships. So we're building relationships with organizations both locally and internationally that help, can help us with assembly and, fulf and fulfillment. Um, one of the partnerships at the moment that we're discussing um, is a big retailer and they could say tomorrow that they want 100,000 kids, which is the discussion we're having right now. We would not be able to meet that demand in the amount of time they would need us to. So building these partnerships is fundamental to us being able to actually again meet this demand. Once we get to a point where we're doing that kind of volume regularly, then we'll be able to really build these partnerships. But and the reason I'm talking about this is because there's this really interesting space as a hardware business where you're not small, you're not actually producing everything locally anymore, or you might continue and grow that capacity, and you're not giant, you're not so big that you can actually afford to do a scale of production or actually continue to raise that demand. There's a kind of in-between space, which is really interesting and difficult, but also part of our approach is how do we scale our production locally enough that we can reach some of the demand and create partnerships where we can learn from that to potentially bring it back into the business. So this is kind of the space that we're in right now, which is um, again really interesting, but still a challenging space um, to exist in. So team has been really exciting. Um, so I've actually only been full time at Technology Will Save Us for the last eight months. I was working three days a week um, as a brand consultant or in my old um, organization. And then kind of Technology Will Save Us was growing two days a week, um, kind of organically, to be fair. So I started eight months ago and our team was essentially this lovely group of people. Um, and over the, the last eight months, we've grown to about 16 people. So the growth of a team has been really exciting for me. Um, the way I really focused on the growth of a team is what are the things we need to be good at as an organization and can I build our teams around those things? So <coughs> production, education, community, um, those are the things we need to be good at and so that's how I really structured our team. So we now have a head of education, we have a head of sales, we have a head a lead product, uh, producer. Um, so these are the ways that I really grown the team and I must say that growing a team has been one of the most satisfying things about the business. All the things we're doing are really exciting, but the team element has been really um, fascinating. We have a management team now, we have structures. That, I mean, you know, those are things that naturally happen in a business, but I don't always think as a startup you're always prepared for it. You're really used to doing everything yourself. And so there's something for me as well about being a founder and a CEO that I have to kind of grow with this um, organization and learn where I need to step back, learn where I need to be involved. Once people are taking on responsibilities, what's my role? But I don't have to do everything. Um, so that's been a really um, exciting part of growing the business. And I'd be happy to talk about that with anyone that wants to talk about that So then the last thing I'm going to talk about is funding. So as I mentioned, we, we bootstrapped the business to profitability and then made a decision about scale. Um, so we just closed a round of angel investment a couple months ago, which was a very exciting and very interesting experience. Um, and the reason we did the funding was because of that in intention to want to grow the community, the offer, our production capabilities um, really consciously and, and, and faster than we would have been able to do without funding. Um, so there's this choice that I think people can make. Do you grow incrementally or do you really um, decide you're going to scale? Uh, so, the things I've learned um, along the way, so investment is complicated and exciting and interesting. Um, brand was a huge part of us being able to really raise money. So brand, the way we define it, is not your logo, it's not your typeface, it's not your colors. It's the things you do in the world, the products, the services, the touch points that your customers actually engage with you in the business. And understanding that so fundamentally was so important for us actually being able to communicate the business, the potential of the business, to our investors, to any grants that we received. Having that really clear story was so fundamental, and not just for me, but the whole team. We were saying the same things, and that was really important. Um, so one thing I learned about investment is it always takes longer than anything. So it took us eight months for our angel round, which was you know about five months longer than I thought it was going to be. 
to take. So having stamina um, and also running a business at the same time is not easy. We weren't a business we were looking for investment, we were a business that was selling products and investment was going to help us reach another scale. That's a really different model than growing a business out of investment. Um, it's really important to understand your supply chain and essentially your margins. That was key. Understanding our sweet spot as far as margins, what was going to actually help us to grow the business. You know, the key is that you have to make the product and sell it for less than you made it for and make sure you can give it to retailers for less than you make it for, which is not very easy. Um, so finding that sweet spot of our margins was just fundamental and being able to actually have conversations with investors and know what we needed as far as um, funding. Um, and then I think the last thing that was really important is knowing when your money is going to run out and what your options are. So we are we were very clear as to how long this investment will kind of take us forward. Um, and we're not necessarily convinced that another round is the only option. Mainly because we've run a business and built a business from selling products. We sold stuff to pay for people to work with us. And that, you know, that actually building a business as opposed to building a startup was a really important um, process for us. Um, and so one thing that was really interesting is grants. Um, being in the UK is a really exciting thing because there's a lot of support for technology and education businesses. Um, a few grants that I'll mention that we won um, were not only fundamental in us growing and raising money, um, but also fundamental in helping us build our resources, um, helping us define our product development, um, our internal design process, brand visibility, and building partnerships. So one of the funds that we won is something called Make Things Do Stuff, which is a consortium of NASTA, which is the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and Art, Mozilla, and Nominate Trust, and it's solely focused on enabling young people to become digital makers. With that funding that we won, we launched our gamer kit, which I just showed you. We have two other kits that we also developed during that process, which we're going to be launching this year. We defined our design process, which is essentially a very user-centered design approach. We did a huge research project about what people, what young people are making in school now, what are they, what, what do the skills they need to know, and most importantly, what are the things they actually care about. And we developed kits around those things. That was all around. That wasn't an investor investing in our business. We didn't have to think about profit. We needed to think about delivering the product, which was a really important thing. Um, with that investment, Beyond Money was also um, business support. So we've been working with a business um, advisor for the last year, who I can't imagine not working with for the rest of my uh, time as CEO. He's incredible. That was a part of the service that was given with that grant, again, which was fundamental. Um, we also won something in something called the Google Rise Fund, which is um, a huge amount of money that Google has put together to support computer science and engineering in, um, in education. Um, we won um, £100,000 to basically launch um, our game market in a thousand code clubs around the UK. Again, that's a pilot to really test um, how do hardware, well, how does hardware actually fit within um, after school clubs. So again, a really exciting and fundamental part of how we're going to scale the business. Not investors, not any kind of um, capital raised through angels, but a grant to basically help us to really focus on a project and process. So yeah, so I guess my point in talking about grants is that grants can be a really exciting way for you to develop and grow a business um, that gives you autonomy and focus on actually building um, a process. So I'm going to end with a quote because it's, um, it's something that was shared with me by one of our advisors and really kind of just resonated with me, just where I'm at in the business. Um, so I'll just read it and then I'll tell you why I think it's really important. So all courses of action are risky. So prudence is not in avoiding danger because that's impossible. By calculating risk and actively acting decisively. Make mistakes of ambition and not mistakes of sloth. Develop the strength to do bold things, not the strength to suffer. So the reason I, I mention that is because um, this idea of calculating risk has been really important to me. Being able to make decisions incrementally while thinking strategically is it, it, it's, it's one of the most fundamental ways for me to actually run a business. Being able to actually see how much I'm going to spend Match strategically is, is really important because as a founder, um, life is really stressful, it's fast, it's complicated, but it's also maybe the most creative, satisfying experience I've ever had. Um, and as a founder, you're constantly questioning your business, your life, your path, its potential, but being able to act with some kind of calculation um, helps to make that a little less of a kind of vague, 
decision and much more of an intentional decision. Um, so I'm not an entrepreneur, I'm a founder that has kind of become an entrepreneur. Um, and I'm doing this because I want to make bold decisions and I want to grow a business that has impact. Um, so that's kind of why I wanted to share this growth with everyone because I think starting from that place of, of, of impact and that place of making a conscious decision to grow some kind of intention is really where our business is. Um, how our business started and where it's growing, basically. Awesome.